From the Thai Cats Audio Network, this is the Thai Cats This Week with RJ Broadhead and Luke Tasker. Great to have you with us on Thai Cats This Week. RJ Broadhead and Luke Tasker. We don't have 9, 10, 12 days between games. Here we go, right after the Ottawa game. And maybe the best effort of the season for the Tiger Cats. They tied their most points scored in a the game. They allowed their fewest they've allowed in a game. Didn't allow a touchdown and. You're going to win a lot of games when you you don't allow a team to get a touchdown, Luke. Yeah, that was a it was a resounding win on in all three phases. Uh, especially what was good for good watching. I was just happy the uh, the Ticats offense really uh, really uh, had an impressive performance. You look at uh, some of the statistics in the Tiger Cats in the first quarter have allowed 17 points all season, and. That is the third best since 1967, so <laughs> well over 50 years. Like That's crazy stuff. So yeah. the defense has been great, uh, and they're up against a rookie quarterback. Do you think it'll kind of be the same philosophy as they had against Ottawa and rookie quarterback in Caleb Evans, and this time it's Taylor Cornelius, who has just over 100 pass attempts in his career? I think you can't expect that. I, I think generally your philosophy against that is you can – you can increase on the risk side of your call a little bit, right? So there's risk reward to everything. If you run a a blitz from the secondary, you're creating a vacancy in that, in that coverage of the secondary, but you are demanding that if a quarterback wants to have a success against you, that they're able to recognize that and and early enough. So we saw some aggressive play call defensively uh, against Ottawa at Tim Horton's field. Uh, and and some success in the pass rush especially i think that if you're any young quarterback really any quarterback but any especially young quarterback preparing against this hamilton defense you've got to be asking yourself what are they what kind of what are the blitzes that they're going to bring and how much time am i really going to have here i cuz if your eyes aren't sharp in the moment if you're not recognizing that man zone and seeing where the pressure is coming from you, you, the clock is going to expire as far as your time, your time in the pocket to make to make a play. So I think I think that we can expect from Mark Washington and the Hamilton defense uh, 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 an aggressive uh, uh, blitz like like we've continued to see. And uh, you know what I think about these defensive secondary. You know, uh, even if you have all the time in the pocket, somebody has to get open to to throw that to throw the ball to. So uh, I think we'll see a good show again. Yeah, it's been fun to watch that secondary. Uh, all of them have at least an interception. Carriel Brooks leads the league with four interceptions. Simone Lawrence in the mix. Going back to the Edmonton offense, with a rookie quarterback, it would lead one to believe we'll see a lot of James Wilder Jr. He's on pace for over 1,000 yards rushing. Just him and William Stanback of Montreal are the only two on pace for over 1,000 yards. But the Hamilton defense has allowed one 100-yard rushing game in their last eight games. I don't know about you, but I'd be surprised – if Edmonton's able to run the ball, Hamilton's defense has been has been that good to, at shutting down the run. Yeah, and Wilder Jr. has has had success against difficult defenses throughout his career. He is an exceptional running back. Uh, I think that we've seen sort of a tale of two stories with the Hamilton uh, uh, run defense. Early in the season, we would see them not allowing i mean the first game against montreal stanback was expected we were expecting to see an incredible rush attack and rush attack and the hamilton defense i mean uh, held him to a, to effectively a, a, a no effect on the for the montreal offense and uh and then at times we've seen uh some teams have success as well i i think this is about at this point in the season they find themselves the hamilton defense that is with their their healthy front four with their guys starting who were intended to start and they're operating at a high level. Um, I do think you can't expect a guy like, like Wilder to have a no, uh, to have no yards gained. I mean, you're not expecting to hold him to nothing. You're just trying to limit those big plays and those explosive run plays that keep drives alive. We'll see him. He's going to get, he's going to get his, he's going to be out there and he's going to be uh, uh, you know, doing his best, but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes even a great player uh, against a defense like this is is uh, not enough. Um, I do expect, I do expect we'll see the the r- same run stopping power and prowess that we've seen in the last weeks. And I go back to Saturday's game against Ottawa. That goal line stand from the Hamilton two, 
stopped them twice, didn't give them an inch, and then they wound up kicking a nine-yard field goal, which Mm -hmm. I was surprised by. I thought, give it another shot. But that, to me, is a feather in the cap for the Hamilton defense that they didn't even want to try three times from the – from the two yard line and Simone Lawrence talked about it and said that was a big turning point. That was in the second quarter Mm -hmm. and they settled for a field goal. It would have been a one point game. Who knows how it would have turned out, but that's a big momentum swing. It was. And in my, there's something about the Hamilton defense that it's not just that they're making big plays, forcing turnovers. There's something timely about the, about when they come up with these stops. So like you said, that would have made this, that would have made it an interesting and close game in the second quarter. Ottawa, Ottawa wasn't having zero success. They were putting some drives together. They were not being. They were not able to finish with points. But their time of possession, actually, uh, they out. They had the ball more often in the first half than than the Ticats did. The turnovers consistently are happening after an explosive play. After an opposing team uh, is stringing success together, that's when the, this Ticat defense gets turnovers. That that comes from guys who who just love football who love making plays they recognize these opportunities and these moments when one of these one of these great players has to step up and do something great this team has been doing that and it makes it it makes it honestly for fans for us it makes it even more fun because we start expecting these big plays and the moments where we want to see them the most yeah you do get that sense when uh, the defense needs to come up big they have been able to do that i'm i'm going to say this hesitantly Uh, Hamilton has not thrown an interception in their last five games. And I say that because I kind of put the jinx on Caleb Evans in the third quarter. I just finished saying he he hadn't thrown an interception in his very next pass. Des Lawrence picked him off, wound up throwing three interceptions. But that takes me to Jeremiah Masoli. You know him really well. Back-to-back 300-yard-plus passing games. He's protected the ball. He's run the ball. Are we seeing the Masoli back in 2018, 2019? I think we absolutely are. And uh, we touched on the success that he had the last two years, short of, of course, uh, the season-ending injury in 2019. But I think we are absolutely seeing him at that level again. It's that combination of making big plays and also controlling what you need to control, just controlling the little things and operating. You can have these explosive quarterbacks, these exciting quarterbacks, but oftentimes um, those big plays that they're able to make are, are the next drive countered by a mistake or an inerrant throw or a turnover. Jeremiah's not doing that. He's taking his shots when he can take them, hitting the big strikes, but then he's just operating when he needs to. Uh, I think he's going to, he has a chance, I should say, to, to get past a hundred straight. I believe it's attempts without an interception that's yes. uh, that's an impressive uh, threshold to hit. I'd be excited if that were to happen uh, tomorrow in Edmonton. Uh, but that comes from from calmness and and an ability to not make let the game be bigger than it really is. It's a, a quarterback has a lot of things to control, but that's controlling those things very well and operating at a high level. Luke, I want your opinion on this. Chris Van Zyl's come back, and all of a sudden the offense seems to be running the ball better, throwing the ball better, the net yards are going up. Is is it fair to say that Chris Van Zyl, who was the most outstanding offensive lineman in 2019, has that much of an impact, or am I over-exaggerating that? Uh, No, I would not not say that's an over-exaggeration by any means. So you've also got Brandon Revenberg at, at left guard, and those two guys, those vets who have both Brandon Revenberg 2018, I believe, was the runner-up for most outstanding lineman that year as well. So you've got two guys who are, who are at at the highest level in the CFL as far as their um, experience and their and their talent, uh, especially in the pass protection. And those guys up there are a are a unit. The communication is so key at that position group, maybe more so than any other position room. Those guys are are required to have their terminology down and to be able to communicate very, very efficiently in in a short period of time at the line of scrimmage and in the huddle and on the sidelines. And when you have those two veterans, Van Zyl and Revenberg, that goes a long way for some of these guys who are still in their first year in the CFL. And Chris Van Zyl, when he was injured, some of those hot days in practice, he was out there kind of coaching the younger offensive linemen. He had the water bottles for them. And and I asked him about it and he said it, 
everybody's equal. If if I need to give guys water to to help the team, that's what I'm going to do. And you just love to have guys like that in your team. He, he's just he's he's one of my favorite teammates, and I only was able to play a year with Chris Van Zyl, and he was in Toronto, of course, for all my all the other years. And I just and I actually have clear images of looking on the field or down the sidelines and seeing this mountain of a of a man <laughs> as a as an opponent. And then when I got a chance to play with him, he he is he is so good for a team. Just a guy like that, a guy with so much experience. He's a real positive a positive uh, voice in the locker room. He does not uh, he is he is not a guy to get bitter about anything. You know, he, he's uh, sort of he has a he has a young heart uh, about him, and and uh, and really great for that position group and great for a team. But to your point, coaching on the field, I mean that I mean he would be highly sought after offensive line coach whenever his career is done, which who knows with that guy, maybe he's got five years still to go, but yeah, yeah that would be, he, he certainly has the experience and the knowledge uh, to, to help young guys like that. It's very much so in his uh, skill set. Well, it's good to give the offensive line some love because they tend to get overlooked unless something <laughs> negative happens. So the, the offense has been moving the ball. I want to ask you a few questions. Uh, just uh, Simone Lawrence, he's a tackle away from 18th overall, all time, and that happens to be Orlando Steinauer as coach. <laughs> Does he pass Coach O on Friday? Yes, and I hope that uh, I hope TSN captures the moment where that happens, and uh, and they get to shake hands or or, or whatever. But uh, certainly a career that's well deserving of of climbing those ranks and 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 other awards that will surely come Simone's way. And I just think, you know, apart from his play on the field. Simone, I've, I've said it in other podcasts, is 21 forever. His just his attitude and energy is is honestly unbelievable to 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 be around, and he is a great uh, a, a great member of a team, and uh, certainly on the field uh, makes an impact every week. There's no there's no game where you and I aren't saying something about 21, uh, you know, making some uh, important play. So excited to see that tackle when it does happen. Yeah, and I've gotten to know him this year and smile on his face. I go back to this past bye week when they had lost two in a row, and I think Louis B. asked him, you know, what's the mindset? And he smiled and said, we're in great shape. Yeah. <laughs> no negativity, just always positive and always has that smile and intense on the field. And yeah. I do think there's something symbolic with the year 2021, and he wears number 21. It uh, just has that special vibe about it. And his three interceptions, a couple of touchdowns, always in the middle of things. Yeah, Twelfth. different. Uh, he's scoring points this year. I don't know what I don't know where that came out of, but man, he's got touchdowns, interceptions, tackles, breaking records. Good for him. He's it really sincerely well deserved. And our buddy Rob Hitchcock, he's only twelve tackles behind him for the Ty Cats all time lead in tackles. So wow. Hitch will be keeping an eye on that. He have to be a pretty big game for Simone against Edmonton, but yeah. it's uh, it's probably bound to happen. Well, I've seen him do that too. I, in Winnipeg, I think it was, he broke the uh, tackles in a game record. Simone, I mean, that did that too. Yep. So you never know what will happen on uh, tomorrow in Edmonton. Uh, Speedy B, uh, Brandon Banks, two receptions uh, from passing Darren Flutie for fifth all-time on the, in Ticats history. Mm. He should get two receptions, you'd think, on Friday. Well, there's been years where I would have had no doubt about that, but you know, <laughs> this year has been has been a, a challenge uh, all around, and it's just every team is different. We were we've kind of been saying that since the start of this year. Uh, I think uh, I think there's a great chance Speedy B absolutely lights it up in Edmonton. Also, you just never know when it's going to go for him, and it's a com- and it's a complicated offense. We I certainly I certainly think that we are going to have Speedy B see Speedy B be a very important of this last stretch of the season and. You know, uh, he's struggled with with uh, injuries throughout the year, like everybody does. But uh, that certainly takes its effect on things. And I think he'll be hungry to get back and uh, get the monkey off of his back after having, uh, you know, an a, a unlikely or you know rare uh, drop from Dane Evans uh, at Tim Hortons Field last week. Yeah, the good players always seem to bounce back with the even even better performances. I did do some calculations too. He's fifty one receptions away from third place on the Ty Cats all-time uh, receiving list. Do you know who's in third place? Uh, and, <laughs> Andy Fantuz. <laughs> no, no, it's you. I'd be oh. bragging about that all the time. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to say that. 
Luke yeah. Tasker, third all-time in Thai Cats history. I'll do the bragging oh, for you. Go. How's that? Yeah, please, please do. <laughs> You're a modest guy, but it's <laughs> it's a it's a a game again that the Thai Cats will be favored in. Edmonton shockingly have not won at home. They're zero and five, second last road game of the season. Mm. And when you get to this point of the season, just in closing here, Luke, can you? I know the Tiger Cats take it one game at a time, but you can see the finish line here, and you start looking at the standings and. Every game's important. Yeah, I won't say must wins. I'll say important. <laughs> yeah, no, it, they are important. You're right. And and in order to keep the same amount of control, maintain the same amount of control over your own fate, then they are uh, incredibly important. I'll say this about uh, Edmonton. It, I believe, I believe that the only year that I that we had games left in the regular season when we were and we were locked out. Uh, was that was 2017. So, you know, we had started 0 and 8 and we had climbed back, but it was just too little too late. And we ended up with three regular season games without a chance to make the playoffs. And we played, I, there were a few of those games we played very well in. Sometimes, you know, I don't know what that is about player psychology. Maybe there's just nothing to lose, or maybe there's just, uh, maybe you have just, you know, you know, there's only these chances to, to make it work, make the season worth it. And it put some good film out there or whatever. And you just play good. And you, the team starts taking risks because there's really no reason not to whatever. I don't, you know, there's probably a thousand reasons, but I'm not going to suspect that we're going to see Edmonton just, you know, take it easy or roll over they, you know, there's going to be a lot of players on that roster, very motivated to, to play, uh, to play at a high level and to make a difference. So it's a it's sort of a dangerous uh, thing to just make any assumptions about a team like Edmonton right now, and uh, if you're Hamilton, we talked about it last week. You keep a losing team losing just by executing and uh, ensuring that you know they have every chance in the world to continue to make the mistakes they've made uh, so far this season. Well, we better wrap this up. There's always so much to talk about after a win, <laughs> but uh, this. It- Four games remain, so yep. uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at 9.45, kind of a weird start time, but uh, uh, if you're tuning in, that's when we'll we'll have it for you. Again, Luke, uh, they're all important now, so looking forward to calling the game with you uh, as the Ticats make their second last road trip. Exciting stuff. I'll see you up there tomorrow, RJ. Awesome. So 9.45, the Tiger Cats are in Edmonton. First time they'll be in minus temperatures. So it's going to feel minus one, minus two, minus three. So it's going to be a little chilly. We'll see how they perform. And please tune in. We'll have the call for you at 9.45 on the Ticats Audio Network. The Ticats This Week with RJ Broadhead and Luke Tasker. Like and subscribe to get their preview the last weekday before every Ticats game.